are determined by our perspective, which leads us to, to mental illness. Uh, mental illness typically strikes about one in five people, at least mood disorders does, and specifically we're talking bipolar disorder today. So what, what is bipolar disorder? Depending on who you talk to, what you read, you may hear that it's biological, that it's a brain disease. Well, yes, I, I believe it is. Maybe it's psychological. I believe it could be also. Perhaps it's even spiritual, a strong spiritual imbalance, or maybe it's a combination of all three. If we look at life holistically, uh, we can believe that it can be biological, psychological, and spiritual. And as we work on each of these components, we gain the ability to live a more fulfilling life and perhaps even to evolve from mental illness to mental health. But surely along the way, depending on the degree of our success, we gain the, uh, the ability to be more resourceful, more pur purposeful, more passionate, and move on. But what if we've been told that there is no cure? There is no cure for bipolar disorder. A drug has not yet been invented. So what do you do? Well, let's look at what cure means. Uh, is a cure for bipolar disorder solely pharmaceutical? I'm pro-pharmaceutical. What if it's maybe emotional or spiritual transformation? I'm pro that too. I'm pro looking at life in all different ways. A cure doesn't just have to be a pill. It can be moving forward. It can be lack of symptoms because of a combination of, of perhaps drug, psychotherapy, and spiritual evolution. Along my journey, reading has been a very wonderful way for me to move ahead. I'm Okay, You're Okay by Eric Byrne, The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck, and Found a Place for Me by Sandra Landsman are all books that look at life and issues, but it also looks at mental illness psychologically. While we can't say defi definitively that when one gets a, a, a mental illness that there's a psychological imbalance, in many, many cases there is a tie-in. And as a psychiatrist said to me a long time ago when he recommended that in addition to seeing him, I go weekly to first group psycholo psychological meetings. I thought, why if I have a brain chemistry imbalance, am I taking my time uh, to travel out of town to meet with a psychologist and a group of people? But I learned along the way that whatever I could learn in life from raising issues of self-esteem or lack of self-esteem, uh, self-concept, uh, anger, rage, humiliation, whatever it is, the more I could find balance and peace in my life, the easier my life became. I do believe that in time, mental illness is even an opportunity to move forward. We understand in the physical, when we want to strengthen the body by going to the gym or going running or lifting weights and all these things, we understand that by facing challenges, call us weights in the gym, we get stronger. It is a little harder to understand that when life gives us its weights and its challenges, as hard and devastating as it can be, that in time, these are opportunities to learn more about ourselves and life. In my life, I, I, I never thought I'd come out the better end. I, I run five careers today because of my previous mental illness. My background is photography, which I still do. I'm a professional speaker, a radio broadcaster, a musician. I do singing and guitar playing in seniors' homes and mental health consulting based on my life experience. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, take you into the world of Barry Shanebaum and what I went through. Growing up in Hamilton, Ontario, just a little west of Toronto, age 18, a typical teenager, and one day waiting for a bus going to my girlfriend's, my mental illness started actually with a premonition. I had a feeling that I was leaving, not just leaving on the bus, but a feeling that I was leaving. But an hour later, sitting in the living room at my girlfriend's, and the scene was set. Her mother was a psychological nurse. Her father worked at the university. I started hallucinating and having delusions. Two days later, I ended up in a locked psychiatric ward. I remember the, the diagnosis was schizoaffective. They didn't know really what was wrong with me. I spent a whole summer in a locked ward. And I remember the kindness of one nurse that's referred to in the introduction. I was, in a lock, I was incarcerated in a psychiatric ward. The year was 1970. The psychiatrists, the nurses, the staff, they were okay, but they weren't all that great. And I didn't think they cared about me as a person, as a teenager who had fallen ill. There was one nurse and her name was Miss Balaban. 
One human being took the time to talk to me and just show that she cared about me. And over 40 years later, I talk about the fact that while I was in my deepest depression and, and hallucinations and delusions and locked up in a ward, that one human being took the time to talk to me. At the end of the summer, they let me go. I went back to high school and I went from basically an A student to a D student. I couldn't get my mental focus back and I didn't have an official diagnosis for what was going on yet. It wasn't until age 22, 22, four years later, that along the way to see my psychiatrist, I had a manic attack. And in this case, <laughs> it's really quite interesting. I, I thought I was a police officer and I actually pulled a car over uh, because the car wasn't doing too well, at least I thought in, in the delusions of my mind. After letting her go with a warning, I went to see my psychiatrist. I was talking a mile a minute. The doctor saw that I was in the phase of mania and diagnosed me as someone having manic depression back in the hospital again. I continued on with my life and eventually started studying photography and I thought life now was fine. I had a diagnosis. I took my lithium carbonate, took my medication, but I was also in psychotherapy. I was in both and I do feel it's very important to not just to take medication when one needs it, but also to see what other emotional or psychological or spiritual help uh, a person can use and, and also having at least one good friend and, and people who believe in you and associating with people who don't believe in you is, is like is, is not doing it any good. Life continued on and I got my degree in photography, started my own business and everything was fine until age 34. I had a massive, massive depression and during this time it was when I was taking a break from the lithium with my doctors. Uh, permission because of the fact that after 20 years of taking lithium, uh, you risk kidney damage. And during that time, when I had this uh, breakdown, the depression was horrible, absolutely horrible. I was off my meds at the time, and I gave up the will to live. And a person like myself who fought my whole life to achieve and overcome had thrown in the towel. I was actively suicidal. And there was one thing that stopped me from actually attempting suicide. I know the stats are devastating that one in seven people will kill themselves because the blackness is so black. My personal views on life are that one can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul. So what good is it to kill the body? And since I believe the soul is divine and would continue on, I would just add more problems to more problems. So I could not kill my soul, which is a good thing. After a very long journey of, of rebuilding and suffering, and at age 37, I walked away from the illness. I evolved out of bipolar disorder to good mental health. It's been a journey. Many people have concern, but what if, what if you remit back to illness? I said, well, many years ago, which is 25 years ago, that I had a fall back position that I would, I saw my folks every week for dinner on a Friday night, and if they saw me going off, they would they would take me back to the doctor. In my, the rebuilding of my life, I used the phrase of connection or reunion. In a sense, I created my own mental health recovery program, I guess based on, on my own thinking. Part of it was, was going back to my past. I went back to my home. This is where I grew up in Hampton, Ontario, with my dad and my sister. I went back to all the places I used to hunt. I did more than that. I, I went back to the schools to try to reconnect. When I had my psychotic breaks, it was like a, a large knife cutting me into pieces and mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, how to get the pieces back together. Well, for my case, it was connecting through music. And the music that was big in the 70s when I first got sick is still important to me today in the music along the ways, but more than just music, uh, even movies, going to movies that had a message for me. Movies like A Beautiful Mind. Movies like To Serve With Love. Movies that I found uplifting and inspiring. Movies of overcoming. Movies of people trying. All made a difference to me. I went back to my family doctor and I got all my medical records. I went back to the school board in Hamilton. I got all my educational records. I wanted to understand myself. Along the way I decided that it would be nice to move out of the city of, of Toronto and get into the country. And here's a scene where I lived many years ago north of Toronto. And sometimes just being out in nature, well, that doesn't cure you of anything, but it certainly can make you feel good. And I believe that anything that we do in life that is authentic, that feels real, that is life-affirming, is good for our mental health. 
as a photographer, which is one of my careers, I analyzed slides and pictures of when I was a child, when I was a teenager. I wanted to get a greater understanding of myself and, and where I was coming from. For me, even going places and, and picking up uh, coffee mugs, mugs or fridge magnets or, or books of worth, and whatever, it was, it, whatever it was that gave me meaning. Drives in the country was very important. This is a picture here of going back to the psychiatric boarding house that I lived in that I moved out of 25 years ago. While I lived there, um, I learned a whole new way of life. My peer group were people like myself who had fallen down very hard. And when I drive by this place 25 years ago to the day, I see a number of the very same people on the front porch having a smoke, going for a coffee. And I ask myself, how did I get out? Why are they still there? I believe it's a series of events, persistence, hope, having some financial resources, having people that believe in you. In this case, I had my folks to support me when I moved out and believing that there is a way to overcome. I remember when I lived there, there were some people who didn't take too much responsibility around this boarding house. And one of the staff said, well, they're sick. They're sick. They, they, they can't take care of themselves. And I said, well, I understand. I had trouble also. But I do believe that when we are at our weakest point, that the smallest bit of responsibility that we can take can help us move forward. And, and that's what I did as I started to find some hope in my life. I want to talk about love and care and support. I already mentioned uh, Miss, Miss Balaban, uh, who was the nurse in the locked psychiatric ward, who, who believed in me. Dulcie worked in the psychiatric boarding house. And here is Dulcie, and, and there was one person who believed in me more than the social workers. I would stand beside her every Friday night while she made dinner. And I said, I stand there in my clothing, which was dirty, because I used to shower regularly every three weeks. And Dulcie would say to me, she said, you'll get out of here. And I said, well, I don't think so. I, I lost my business. I lost my self-respect. I was mentally ill. I was ashamed. Many of my friends had abandoned me. How do you begin? How do you start to build your life when you think everything is lost. Well, I believe it's the same way they built the Great Wall of China. It's brick by brick. It's step by step. Here's a picture of love that I took in Tanzania a few years ago. Love is eternal. Love and faith and support wherever we can find it. Along the road, I've come to believe in the bigger picture of life. Let's call it the divine. I come from a background of academically math and science. They've always been my strong subjects. They still are. But with the events that I've gone through and some events that I've gone through uh, spiritually, but I won't get into detail at the moment, uh, I've come to believe that we are part of a bigger picture. Uh, we, we can be part of that bigger picture when we go out into nature, uh, when we look into a child's eyes, another person's eyes, or, or, or the cat or the dog snuggles in our lap. And I do believe that in about all cases, that when life gives us challenges, that there is an opportunity to find our way through it. This is a picture from my book, Hope in Heroes. Hope in Heroes has 47 heroes of the planet, uh, world leaders and local heroes who, in my opinion, have done great things for the planet, inspired by my past. This is Dune Lankard, uh, an EAC native Indian from Alaska. And uh, I was up there in Cordova, Alaska, about 14 years ago. And while we were there doing the photo shoot, there was no wildlife. And I said to him, Dune, wouldn't it be great to get an eagle in the picture? And if you see that little speck to the left, within about three minutes of saying that, uh, two specks came over the horizon. This is one of them there. And I go, I just hope it's an eagle and not a pigeon. And there we were, an eagle with the wings spread above this native man's head call this the era of the miraculous and I know our native people I've been told have a higher connection to the land but they don't have it exclusively the more that we can connect to ourselves to our higher power to all aspects of ourselves uh, medically psychologically spiritually and live authentic lives and believe that there is a reason for the suffering and even if we don't believe there's a reason the suffering is not a good thing that there's a way to get through it I believe that is 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 all good Synchronicity. Synchronicity has, paid, has played a big part in my life, particularly in my rebuilding. And what the books say, the more that we acknowledge synchronicity, 
the more that, that it will happen in my life. This is the second reprinting of my book, Hope in Heroes. And when I had the idea for Hope in Heroes 15 years ago, I was just uh, three years out of the psychiatric boarding house, rebuilding my life, had an idea to do a project of people who have done great things for the world. How do you begin? Well, the way I began was life actually met me halfway. I was sitting in my studio and there was, there was a knock on the door. There was a guy standing there who had some CDs for people who were temporarily sharing my studio. And then he said to me, oh, I see that you're a photographer. Well, besides managing bands, I, um, I also sell tripods. We went out to the street and opened up the trunk of his white Cadillac and he talked to me about the tripods. And I was impressed by his husband. I said, Steve, I have a dream, I have an idea of putting together a book of integrity, of heroism. Can we meet for coffee? And we met for coffee and I hired Steve for the first for a number of months to put together a package and through his help Nelson Mandela, you can see in the right in the middle, was the first person his people uh, agreed that he would be in the book. And many people and their representatives over time agreed to be in the book. You can see second from the right is Maya Angelou. Lower the left is, is Martin Sheen. Second from the top on the left is Dr. Phil McGraw. It is amazing that when you have a dream and you have to work at it logically and systematically and, and, and go down corridors, one door closes, another one may open and work. So synchronistically, this Steve fellow was delivered to my door, but I also needed to grasp the opportunity. Here is a person who grasps opportunities. Julia Butterfly Hill has a world record for tree sitting. Now this is a person with a brain disorder, but differently. She was involved in a car accident where a drunk driver smashed into her car, and she, used, she was in the hospital with brain uh, illness for months. She rebuilt her life. She was in her early 20s, and she wanted to find a mission for her life. And she went to the West Coast and met some environmentalists. We're trying to save some of the last tracks of redwood trees in the West Coast. And because she had overcome this serious illness, she, her, her desire was even amplified to do something in life. And they asked her to go up for a few days and live on a six by eight foot platform. And she said to herself when she was up there, I've overcome a serious brain injury. Uh, I'm, I'm not coming down to we save the tree. And she lived in this tree for two years, she did not touch the ground for two years. It is amazing that when we have belief and faith and hope in science and medicine and psychology and spirituality and everything and in the combination that works for us that we can do amaz amazing things. The next slide is a very brief clip that ran on our national broadcaster CBC here in Canada of the book launch of Hope and Heroes. I like photography because it's so spontaneous. Mary Scheinbaum sometimes shoots buildings, corporate ads, or even squirrels, if that's what his clients need. But for the last three years, he spent much of his time traveling around the world, photographing portraits of integrity. The criteria I used was people that had inspired me personally. People like the late Charles Templeton. His insight into the human spirit helped Scheinbaum beat manic depression. He also got him his first portrait. Billy Graham. Charles said to me these exact words, I don't want to go into this thing blind. What exactly do I tell Billy? And I said, well, tell him I'm doing a project on people of integrity and how they've impacted positively on the world. And then I said to myself, wow, what a great idea for a project or a book. Shane Baum drew strength from hearing people speak about positive achievement, and he set out to photograph the ones who moved him most, a handcuffed Martin Sheen, Scientist Dr. Jane Goodall, Senator Joseph Lieberman, Rick Hansen, Bonnie Raitt, Nelson Mandela, 47 dauntless role models in all. Shane Baum admits the definition of a hero has changed since the tragic events of September 11th. Now we hear it every day in the news. And in a time of crisis, society needs its heroes even more. One thing about the book is for people to admire these heroes, and they're all admirable people, we should look at to the hero inside of ourselves and how we can improve our own lives and people around us. Major General Lewis McKenzie is in Shane Baum's book. Fire up the police for the soldiers and folks like that, and ordinary, ordinary civilians that try and save the occupants of Congress or the White House by crashing an airplane. That's pretty heroic. I don't think anybody will debate that. There is a salute to patriotic heroism. Chris Robertson rode his bike from the bottom of Canada 
to the top. I spoke to five million Canadians about Canadian unity. How are you? Vancouver's Jenny Legon battled racism to become another type of hero. In 1935, she was the first black actress to sign a long-term contract with a major Hollywood studio. Everybody that's, that's there, this big book out, has a def definitely uh, a hero quality about them. For Shane Baum, this project is more than a labor of love. He's donating some of the profits to charity, but ultimately, he hopes these portraits will be as inspiring to others as they are for him. Leslie Wasserman, CBC News, Toronto. Coping Heroes is now available as an ebook off my website, BarryShaneBaum.com. Along the way, I found that every obstacle presents an opportunity. Sometimes we really have to search for the opportunity. It takes purpose, focus, determination, passion, tenacity, and resourcefulness. I want to tell you a, a short story of an obstacle that in time presented an opportunity. When I moved out of the psychiatric boarding house many years ago, I moved to a rooming house down the street. I slept on the floor in my sleeping bag. My dad paid the rent. I, I was looking to rebuild my life. I found an abandoned kitten down the street and brought it into my place. And my landlord heard about it, and though I had the right to keep a pet, he broke into my room the next day and threw, threw up my pet. And here I was a person who lived in a boarding house for 16 months, who had basically fallen off the face of the earth for three years. I have a little kitten, and my landlord breaks into my place, throws up my pet, and I had to make a decision. Was I going to be a victim, or would I be a victor? And I certainly felt like a victim. So I went for a consultation with a lawyer and called the police. The police wouldn't charge him for break and enter. So instead I went to a justice of the peace and he was charged. We had a trial and eventually I, I won in court. Along the way though, they wanted to evict me and I just moved into this rooming house. The good thing is I decided to move. And here's the, the positive part was all my bloggings were still in the storage locker and in the boxes. The fact that I was forced to move earlier than I wanted to meant I got to get going sooner than I would have. So sometimes we could, we, we have to try to find an opportunity from every obstacle, and I do believe it is there. Well, transformation. How do we move from mental illness to mental health? How can it happen? My transformation has taken a number of routes. If I would have to give the short form of my rebuilding of my life and my transformation and walking away from the illness now in 25 years I would call it hope and persistence the longer form is medication I took for a very 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 long time I was in psychotherapy for even longer I was an individual in group I also was in bioenergetics which is a, a type of psychotherapy maybe not a psychotherapy but it's working with the energy um, and it's by Dr. Alexander Lowen, L-O-W-E-N, who talked about working with the energy of the spine and working with anger and rage and all different things. Number three, spirituality. If a person is religious and you find support and comfort and strength in religion, go for it. If meditation works for you, that is also very good. I use visualization in a very big way. I used to think it was hocus pocus. The book said, Anything the subconscious mind, anything the human mind can, let's start right from the top, anything the, anything the subconscious mind can believe uh, can happen in time. And but when we put this into the subconscious mind, we have to say that what we want already exists. I thought it was hocus pocus, but what we're doing in a sense is magnetizing the parts of our mind to accept the fact that whatever we want to get in time, we can actually get there. But it also takes a lot of hard work. It takes setting goals, resetting goals, and moving forward, sometimes forward and backward, but always keeping the eye on the prize. Number five for me, very big has been education. It can be formal education. It can be self-education. Books for me have been very, very, very important. I just want to name a few books that have been key in my life. And I'd also like to send you the list of my 100 key books, you know, Overcoming Mental Illness, if you're interested. Just email me, barry at barryshanebaum.com, and I will send the list to you at no charge. One book that's been very important for me is The Psychology of Self-Esteem by Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. Not that having low self-esteem causes mental illness, not that high self-esteem 
beats mental illness, but being able to have a higher level of self-esteem means we can move through life easier. The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy. So much of what we do is ruled by the subconscious mind. And the more we can get in touch with the reservoir of thought below our conscious mind, I believe it is a way forward. There's three books in the list by John Bradshaw, The Family, Family Secrets, and Healing the Shame That Binds You. I believe the more that we can understand our role in the family, and maybe we've had perfect families, but you know, the way we see ourselves in the family, older, middle, younger, the way we're treated, the way our parents treat us, all these things, even the best of parents that have the highest demands on their kids, that could be an obstacle if the child feels they have to live their life for their parents. So the more that we can understand where we fit in the family and how we acted is a way to move forward. As a Man Think this is a book by James Allen. It's also in your book list. A wonderful book on life, a small book of powerful, powerful thought. Care of the Soul by Thomas Moore. Uh, Thomas Moore was a Buddhist monk. Uh, his book is one of deep thought, and it's made quite a difference in my life. Again, if you wish to get the list of 100 key books in overcoming mental illness, psychiatry, psychology, spirituality, genetics, environment, uh, just email me, barry at barryshanebaum.com. This is my homepage. My website is barryshanebaum.com. I am in my ninth year of radio broadcasting. If you uh, click on the, on the radio button, it comes to my radio page. I have four years a podcast on my site. I've had a number of psychiatrists, psychologists, spiritual leaders, politicians, musicians. Uh, the mandate of the show is people trying to live a, a full life and, and hopefully supporting critical thinking. I do appreciate any referrals for speaking. I'm an inspirational speaker, speaking Canada. Love to speak more in the States and internationally. Love to hear from you if you have any uh, referrals at all. I took this picture in New York City a few years ago at Strawberry Fields, and I do believe that we listen to the song by John Lennon, Imagine. The more we imagine, the more we imagine that we can overcome challenges and not accept limits that are given to us by society. So actually, that's the end of this presentation. I look forward to taking any questions from people who are online today. Ashley? Thank you so much, Barry. That was absolutely wonderful. We really appreciate it. So we'll be taking questions now. Um, our first question is, our first question, sorry, I'm just going through them right now, is what would you say your top coping, coping strategies are? My top coping strategies? It's a number of them. Um, one is trying to to seek balance in, in my life. I know at times, even to the present day, when I feel overwhelmed, sometimes it's giving myself a time out. It's uh, taking two or three deep breaths, uh, realizing um, that going back to the book, The Road Less Traveled, the book starts off the first sentence that life is full of problems. Accept that. And once we accept that life is full of problems, it's not so much of a problem. It's a number of things. It's, it's you know, going into nature, going for a drive, listening to some music. Perhaps it's uh, forgiving the person who I believe has wronged me, or perhaps it's forgiving myself for overreacting if I have, or for making the mistake that I've done. Uh, it's associating with people who believe in me, but also people who will also hold me to account. So it's, it's a number of things, and, and uh, every, every situation gives me a different uh, series of things that I can use to, to cope with whatever the challenge is. Thank you. Uh, we have one comment, uh, very soul soothing regarding your webinar. Um, you. Our next question is, our son is bipolar, but he doesn't want to talk to us about it right now. How can we help him learn how to deal with his illness instead of just waiting for the next manic episode? It's a problem when people young or older uh, have uh, come down with the mental illness, uh, which brings us to stigma. There is a stigma. There is a fear. Uh, I guess a few things. Uh, one thing that I say to people is that uh, I've come out the better end. I've worked hard. I've also been lucky. 
things have lined up, but I've worked very, very hard. Uh, sometimes people go to my website, which is BarryShaneBaum.com, and I'm very open on my biography and my keynotes and other things that I've, I've, I've suffered. It's been hard. Uh, I've had to work very hard. I've had a lot of losses along the way, and that through suffering and challenges, uh, I was able uh, to come out. So that's one thing, referring to my website. Uh, the other thing is uh, to, I guess in a sense, not push this, the, the sun too much, but realize that in time, the problem has to be addressed. And to help couch it in terms that um, bad things do happen to good people, which is the name of a book by Rabbi uh, Kushner, but when bad things do happen to good people, life is full of challenges. Sit down with your loved one and say, okay, um, we're going to sit down in a day or two or a week or a month, but we will have to sit down with love and with balance and with limits and see how we can move forward. Again, the, the route is, is complex. Usually the first way is to start with the medical doctor and a psychiatrist, but it's also good to speak to a psychologist, firstly or secondly, and then start to do reading and go into uh, all these wonderful self-help organizations. Thank you. How do you stop feeling sorry for yourself and move forward? Uh, that's, that's a good one. It's, you know, it's easy. It's easy to feel sorry uh, for yourself. And, and um, well, it, it's like, how, how, do you, how do you change the tune? If you're, listening, if you're listening to the radio and you don't like the music, you change the station. But if you're listening to the voices in your head and feeling sad and sorrowful, um, sometimes it's, it's changed the scene. It could be go out for a cup of coffee and uh, have a slice of pie. Now, you can't do that every day because there'll be other issues. It's, it's realizing that how do you change the tune? It's all different ways, uh, again, of um, trying to find some good from the suffering. Perhaps it's forgiveness. Perhaps it's a change of scene. Perhaps it's, um, it's doing something, something different. When you were and yeah. reading and reading, I mean, reading is one. Reading is one of the greatest gifts. Uh, we we all have access to libraries, but now that most of us have a computer, every computer is a reference library, and we can choose what we put in our heads from the good stuff to the, the uh, to the junk. We can watch reality TV shows that always have an aspect of humiliation and uh, brinksmanship, or we can watch shows and hang out with people that are more uplifting. And I do believe the more we put the energy into inspirational areas and uplifting and uplifting people, we support ourselves and it can change the tune in our mind if we're feeling sorry for ourselves. And there's always someone worse off than us, maybe volunteering and helping those that have less than we do also as a way to help ourselves. I went for years and years being undiagnosed, and then once I was, it took a suicide attempt that many years later for me to be hospitalized for the first time. Do you think I'm on a much slower path to recovery having not had this extra medical attention that you had? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. If you could maybe rephrase it or, or do it slower. Uh, she was saying, or the person was saying that it has taken them a long time. Um, right than you have because of the medical attention. So do you think she's on a slower path or? Well, I, I, believe, I believe everyone is on their path. I mean, my journey, my journey to overcoming uh, a mental illness, bipolar disorder was, was, was over 20 years. It was a very, very long journey, which I, I didn't think I'd make it through. And I believe that everyone uh, has to find their own path. The more that we can be true to ourselves. Again, you know, if we feel good around the color, color yellow, and we feel good uh, walking along the water, and we feel good listening to some type of music, and it's uplifting, uh, if we can put more energy into things that support us and be more authentic, I believe that helps us move along the way. But every journey is, 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 is unique. Ne ne never give up. My message is never give up. And if one route doesn't work, then, then try another one and try another one. And always realize uh, the good that comes from the bad is that the more we keep searching and believing, we strengthen our spirit, we strengthen our soul. When, we, when you were in the rooming home, was your family aware or involved with you during this time of your life? 
Uh, yes, my parents were uh, supportive when I lived in this place. They'd come to to visit me. Um, I, I'm, I'm lucky in that my my family uh, stayed around me. I, I know of people who were where uh, uh, parents dropped, where family drop you uh, when things go wrong. And uh, so, uh, yes, uh, some of my friends stopped calling um, when I got into trouble. I mean, I was I was down a very, very, very deep hole. And it's even understandable uh, that people would uh, would not want to be around me. But you also learn who your friends are, who stands with you uh, through your darkest times. And we also need to forgive those who, who perhaps can't take the fact that their friend is, is gone down a very deep and dark path, because maybe it's scary for them. Do you have any suggestions how to initiate a conversation with a family member with bipolar disorder? This person has only disclosed his mental illness to an extended family member and not to anyone within the immediate family, including his wife and adult children. I believe, I believe that there's a tactful way of saying anything to anybody. So again, with not having more details on this particular situation, I do believe that every person who is suffering is uh, showing some, you, you just can't hide everything. So for the person who doesn't want to talk about it with certain family members, uh, for those who can talk to this person to say, well, you know, we care for you, we love you, uh, um, and you may think it's a secret, but uh, you, you, other people can tell, and people care about you, family cares about you, other people care about you. Um, how can we open up a dialogue? Sometimes it's maybe putting it back to the person, and if they say, well, no dialogue, well, um, okay, well, okay, no dialogue for today, or no dialogue to next week. Uh, but it's uh, important to, to stay on it, and uh, set limits and, and extend the limits. But I do believe there, there are ways by being resourceful and insightful to talk to anyone about anyone in time, with time. Thank you. You're Our welcome. next question is, I have to go back to work soon after years of sick leave and I'm scared. Do you have any advice on how to cope with the new challenges? Yes, well, going, going back to work and this person's been off work for years? Um, yes. Uh, well, first of all, um, kudos to you. Kudos to you. Congratulations <laughs> for um, um, being in a position to get back to work. That takes a lot. That takes courage. That takes a lot of faith. It takes facing fear. How will your coworkers treat you? And there'll be new people, you know, who you don't know. And, and how will the bosses treat you? I, I, I I think the first thing to do is, is, is feel proud. Feel proud about yourself and acknowledge that, that it's not going to be easy all the time. Believe, pray and believe, pre prepare for the best, but realize there'll be some challenges. And um, assume going back, the bosses know. So if there's a, a problem, uh, hopefully the bosses will, are, will be uh, accommodating. You can sit down and talk. But uh, the fact that you're going back is was wonderful, and uh, I've, I found along the way with my ups and my downs, <laughs> um, pun intended and no pun intended, along the years, that the more I talked about what I've been through, I've been through uh, a lot of suffering and created a lot of trail of suffering for other people when I was in, in, in my depths, that as I was on the road up and as I talked about it, and a lot in the media, I've done a lot of TV, radio, newspaper, magazine, and I was shocked years ago, starting about 13 years ago, the more I talked about the past and, and all the dark places I was, people, instead of saying, oh, you were, you were bad or wrong or sick or whatever, they'd say, they'd say, congratulations. So <laughs> the more I talked about what I went through, the more people championed me forward and saw me as, as someone who had overcome. So I think you'll probably be, probably be pleasantly surprised that a lot of people at work will, you'll be their secret hero. And maybe you'll be the hero and they'll, and they'll tell you how proud they are of you. Thank you. How do you know if your feelings are realistic, not due to your mental state? Is this question directed to me specifically or a general question? I think a general question. It's a very, it's a very good question. Well, 
those of us who have uh, struggled with mood disorders or bipolar or, or mental illnesses in general, I, I believe along the way we, we, uh, we have checkpoints. And uh, it's very good to have a friend or a family member to check in. Also, um, all cities, most cities, all cities have telephone distress center volunteers. Uh, I've been a telephone distress center volunteer in Toronto. And during my darkest days, I used to call. And these were the, the strangers at the end of the line that I'd call at 3 in the morning. And sometimes you couldn't even get through for 25 minutes because everyone else was calling them. Um, having a stranger at a distress line to, to bounce it off them or talk to someone or, or, or write down. I've maintained lists for years. I still do a pro and call and up and down, positive and negative. And by writing down how you're feeling and then looking at it objectively, and uh, sometimes we can get a, a perspective of where we are that we wouldn't get if we don't try to get outside of our head, if that makes sense, what I'm saying. Yes, thank you. How does one overcome the brain fog, brain fog and feelings of inadequacy that may come with this illness and going back to work? And that, that was brain fog, you said? Right. And feelings of inadequacy. I believe every person uh, suffers from inadequacy. It just depends to, to the degree, you know, keeping up with the Jones or the Schwartzes, et cetera. Um, going back to a theme I believe I've been seeing is, is getting back uh, deeply into our, our body, into our soul, and acknowledging, okay, acknowledging our strengths. Uh, a friend of mine said to me years ago, what's the purpose of life is to maximize our positive, to minimize our weakness. And also said is the purpose of business is to sell your strengths and to buy your weaknesses. So I believe the more that we can acknowledge to ourselves in the quietness of our room and our minds, the more we can acknowledge without boasting because we're just being open to ourselves, the more we acknowledge our, our God-given gifts and the gifts we've worked on and acknowledge where we're not so strong, we can't be good in everything, uh, that the more we are realistic, the more we can move forward. And it's easy always to feel inadequate. I mean, the advertising industry, which, which is fine, I've worked in it also, part of it is to make us feel inadequate. So we'll go out and buy the next Rolex watch or the fancy car or clothing. And it's nice to have all these things, but it's realizing at the end of the day, the measure of a man or a woman or a child is not what they buy, what they wear, it's, it's who we are and how we treat others, uh, how we love and how we are loved. And those last few words are, I think, from the Wizard of Oz at the very end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> On your transformation, when you mentioned the psychotherapy time, who introduces this to you? Well, in my case, in, in my case, I was seeing a psychiatrist who, I'm friends with all my old doctors. Um, and, uh, and sometimes I lectured hospital rounds and to, to medical practitioners on my past. It was my psychiatrist, uh, who I'm still in touch with as a friend, uh, who after seeing him for about a year, I was in the book 21, 22, and says, well, okay, we've come this far. Uh, I want to refer you to my associate, uh, who's a psychologist. And, and uh, the, the downside of seeing a psychologist in Canada is they're not on OHIP, our, our, our payment plan where the government covers it. I know in the States you also have a very different scene in different countries is differently. Uh, with psychologists, of course, you're dealing solely with the emotions and not getting into medicine while that might eventually be changing. So um, th there's always colleges of physicians and surgeons, colleges of psychologists. And, and the nice thing about psychologists uh, is that they realize you have to pay for it out of your pocket in most cases, unless there's a, a plan through work that a lot of them will work out of plan that they'll take a reduced uh, fee so that the, quote, the patient, the consumer uh, client uh, can afford to get help. Uh, I believe a referral from a doctor or, or just picking up the phone or going on the internet and making some phone calls or calling a local college of physicians and surgeons or psychologists. Thank you. I agree with not associating with people who don't believe in me. Seeing me at my best before we lived together, my partner was very supportive now that he has lived with a rapid cycling bipolar, well, that belief is eroding. What next? I need support from my partner, but the feedback on the projects I'm working on is very negative. Any suggestions? I did tell him about the condition and let him know the challenges of a relationship. 
Well, the only thing I've learned, not that I always live it, I've learned that the only person we can control is ourselves, and we can't even always control ourselves. The most we can do is, is in a loving way, in a caring way, is to try to influence uh, those who are with us uh, to, to, to a way that we, that we can get along with them better. Uh, realizing that we can't change another person. Uh, sometimes relationships uh, change in time. Uh, I don't believe relationships should be terminated because of a person is going through uh, mental or physical or other challenges. But sometimes uh, a, a sitting down is very, very important. I guess what we call it a clearing of the air. And a clearing of the air can be very hard and very scary. And I know this personally because you know sometimes we're scared to hurt the other person's feelings or we're scared to be too blatant, or we're scared that maybe we'll be insulting or rude. But I believe if we think it through carefully, and we come from a pure and open heart, and it's not coming from vengeance or anger, but we wanted to let this person know, or other people know, this is where I'm coming from, this is how I feel, it's not against you, it's how I feel. I believe that it is a way forward, it's an opening of the communications. One thing is guaranteed, that when you start to share, you can't control what their response will be, but it is important that we share where we are after we think it through carefully because if, we, we, if we're not real with ourselves, in time we will suffer if we hold lies in our own heart. Thank you for that. I lost my job due to this disease. How do you handle the stigma is the question when you're asked, what do you do for a living or how are you? when you are literally stuck in a depression and not working for a long mm -hmm. period of time? That's, that's a good question. Um, I believe that we should choose our answers, which, and that if we're between jobs and haven't worked for a while, uh, first of all, we, we don't owe an explanation to anyone, but we may feel that we do. So I would say, uh, here's a few things. I'm, I'm taking time out taking time up for myself. I'm, I'm doing some travel, I'm working on the hobbies, um, and you, you don't owe anyone. Now, if it's someone close in your life, well, of course, they're gonna know where you are and, and you need to explain. But um, I also find that these things are very hard to answer. So what I've done along the way is, is write these things down and write down, say, 10 ways of saying it. What feels the best way? Is it feel good to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a time out. Well, how long have you been doing that? Well, I've, um, a while, you don't even have to say how long. If you can say it with confidence that this is the decision on the word to choose to say, if other people don't like it, <laughs> it doesn't matter because you have to be true to yourself. If you think you owe another person an explanation, then ask yourself, why is it so important what another person thinks? And remember, all that I'm saying today, I've been on probably both sides of the fence on both these things and all these things. Are, have you had any acquaintance with a 12-step program? A, a 12 step program, is this like for addictions or is this mental health or? Uh, addictions. Personally, I haven't had issues with addictions, but let me expand on that. I would say I, I have not had a problem with addictions, but I know what it's like. Um, I've never had an, an issue with uh, drugs or, or alcohol, but I know what it's like when I'm having a, a piece of cake or chocolate or I'm drinking a soft drink. And I, I know how, when that is in my system, how good I feel. And it's so easy uh, to sit down with a big bag of potato chips. So while I haven't had a weight problem, except when I was sick many years ago when I didn't exercise for three years, when I buy potato chips, I'll buy the little, the little bag. I know if I buy the big one, I'll probably finish it in two days. So I do my best even cutting down on, you know, like it's easy to get addicted to Facebook or going on the internet is, is uh, set, out, set aside some time and walk away. So that's the closest I've come to addiction as far as how I spend my time and what type of sweets I put inside my mouth. Thank you. Um, in a relationship, what are some preventive measures that can be taken in order not to hurt your significant other? Well, that's, that's a broad question, but I'll, I, will, I will try to answer that question. 
love is the most important thing, but it's also important that to love another person and treat them with respect should not be at your own expense. So if the person you're with has all these expectations, you want to make them happy. But depending what it is, if you sell your soul to make another person happy, ask yourself what you're doing and realize that it isn't balanced. Um, I, I believe uh, to thine own self uh, be true. And there's a, um, a phrase from uh, ancient Jewish philosopher Hillel. I wish I had the words down straight, but it goes something like this. Um, if I'm not for myself, who am I? If I'm only for myself, what I? If not now, then when? And this comes down to balance. Uh, just like in a teeter-totter or, or uh, you know, an airplane goes up in the air and needs the right and the left wing, uh, wing to fly, how do we find the balance in ourselves and in relationships? And I do believe that it takes time to when to be assertive, when to be passive, and, and we're going to stumble along the way, and along the way, we need to learn to say, I'm sorry, and we need to say, I forgive you, and even if the person doesn't apologize, uh, just to uh, realize that all of us will make mistakes, and we will always make mistakes, is trying to reduce the severity and the number of mistakes. Making mistakes is natural. That's how we learn. Thank you, Barry. Um, I am out, I am a out gay person in my 30s who is a mental health professional. Do you have any suggestions on disclosure and coming out with mental illness at work? I am tired of being in the closet with mental illness. I fear being, being outed will burn professional bridges in terms of employment. Also, when you are a mental health professional, it makes accessing treatment systems complicated because you fear being outed. Well, I, I've heard that there's, believe it or not, there's stigma in the helping professions, in the mental health uh, professions. Uh, Again, going back to a theme, I do believe it's important to find uh, someone at work uh, to, to speak to. Uh, most offices are certainly more progressive than they used to be. Um, often we are, are surprised by when we share something with another person or a coworker or an employer that uh, people are much more open than what we think they are. Uh, it takes a certain amount of risk. Uh, again, I'm a believer to plan this in advance, to uh, write it all down, like literally write down the script and let's say in the script or write an email to yourself, what if when I disclose at work and this is how they respond, it's like a slap in the face. How do I respond? Uh, plan it all in advance, write it down, look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, if they act positively, uh, great, that's going to be fabulous. What if, what if they're even, they act against the law or, or they're just rude or nasty or, or they humiliate you? Think it through, feel, feel it through, even role play with another person. Uh, and then when you come into it, if it happens, the good or the bad or somewhere in the middle, um, and this is what politicians do. When these politicians do their debates, uh, um, it's, it's all role played. Everything is role played in advance. It's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry, we have time for one more question. And so I apologize if we have not gone back to you, but um, after this question, Barry, if you don't mind um, giving everyone your email address and website link again, we would greatly sure. appreciate it. Sure. So this question is, how did you go about changing at, or adding careers with all that you've gone through? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I have five careers. I graduated from university in 79 with, with photography. Um, Ten years ago, tw actually, um, actually about 12, 13 years ago, I was in interviewed for the Hamilton Spectator. On my website, BarryShaneBaum.com, click on Media Room, you can see the article from the Hamilton Spectator. It's called Back from the Brink. And I talked about my past, and I was so scared about stigma. In reality, everyone said, well, good for you. You have overcome. So about 10 years ago, two years later, I decided to be more serious about my speaking. And the way I started speaking professionally, and speaking, you always pay your dues. You speak for free for too many times, but you know you're making a difference, and you get to improve every time you speak. There's two areas. I called up a whole bunch of rotary clubs uh, in the greater, greater Toronto, Ontario area. And I also called the local Mood to the Service Association, where I run a men's group as a volunteer monthly, and I asked for a list of their chapters in southern and northern Ontario. I called up every single one, and many of them had me in to speak to the groups, 
In most cases, I didn't get paid. I might have got a handshake. But I also got referrals, sometimes ended up on television, got referrals to speaking engagements. And the more you put it out there, the more may come back. And the more experience you get, the better um, you can get. So as far as radio, I was a guest on a, a Christian station in Kitchener, Ontario, just west of Toronto, nine years ago, talking about my book. And, and my background is Judaism. And the manager says to me, do you want your own show? I thought, well, this is a Christian station. I'm Jewish. Why is he inviting me to have a show? And I said, sure, why? Because I'm a photographer. And he says, well, Christian station, religious license. We could use some Jewish programming. So we negotiated back and forth, and about six weeks later, I had my first show called Sunday Mornings with Barry Shanebaum. And I brought on some of my Jewish friends and did some topics on the Middle East. Over the last eight years, it's evolved to a 60-minute show on all four Christian sister stations in Kitchener, London, Woodstock, and Brantford. All this information is on my website, barryshanebaum.com. Click on radio. It's evolved to a show on life and society. Most of my guests are authors. And surprisingly, most of my guests end up being from California uh, for some reason, but from all over North America and also at times internationally. Uh, many of my guests are academics, and, and a lot of the topics are on mental health issues. One of my favorite guests was Dr. Sergami from Tufts University in Boston. His book is on leadership and how world leaders who have faced a mental health challenges end up being better leaders. It's two more careers, music, I sing and play guitar in seniors' homes. I've always played guitar, I'm self-taught, and I made a decision years ago, besides my volunteer work in music, to contact the seniors' homes. I love going there, you make a bit of money, but more importantly, you get to talk to people who have lived full lives and they're in their last quadrant of their life and just talk to them and, and you see the difference the music makes in their lives. The fifth career is mental health consulting. Uh, um, some people hire me who have had their own journey, who realize, that well, I'm not a medical uh, practitioner at all. I, I have the, the battle scars and the glories of overcoming the illness and being through it. So, And I look at life holistically. I'm not anti-anything. I'm pro all different steps of moving ahead. So there's, there's the five careers. Uh, life can come up better. It takes work. It takes faith. It takes positive people. It takes a certain amount of luck. And certainly it takes persistence, tenacity, and perseverance and love. Thank you so much. And again, we apologize that we did not get um, to all of your questions today. Um, Barry. Could, could I just yeah. add, Ashley? Yes. That anyone wants to email me their question, I, I promise they will respond. Barry at BarryShaneBaum.com. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And thanks, everyone, again, for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.